Okay, uh, nice to see you all again. Enjoyed seeing everyone last night. Uh, they do say there is no free lunch or no free drinks, so the punishment for the drinks last night is you have to listen to me talk today. So, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, I'm Aaron Syme, I'm CEO and founder at WebRTC Ventures. We're a custom design and development firm specializing in building live video applications. Uh, so we, um, since 2015, have been building video applications, as I mentioned yesterday, increasingly building uh, conversational AI into that as well. Another change that we've, we've made this year is um, starting to offer more maintenance and support contracts to our clients, which traditionally, the way we worked is, you know, many custom development shops who contract with us to build your application, and then we would uh, typically turn that over to you, perhaps your own internal team then manages it from there, or for a lot of especially startup type clients that we worked with, the, um, we were kind of helping them build the prototypes to get funding, which they would then hire teams to then take care of the production version with, or to even build the final version of it with. So we often got to uh, hand off code for a long time, which is kind of convenient, um, but uh, now increasingly are taking on the production management and support of that even in a 24-7 model. So that's that's kind of what I'll talk a little bit about today is what, uh, what we've learned so far doing that, a couple things specific to communication applications around that, uh, and uh, definitely welcome any comments or questions around that or, you know, because some of you all uh, no doubt have experience in that and, and uh, perhaps more, and so certainly welcome ideas for other things that we could be doing too. So we'll talk a little, uh, about the impact of, you know, knowing that you're going to do the maintenance around it on the life cycle, some things to do prior to deployment in the deployment process, a little bit about support teams, uh, and, uh, and then handling that ongoing after that. And I'll use, uh, I won't uh, quite name the client, but I'll use an EdTech client of ours as an example, uh, sort of through the conversation, so just a, a little bit of background on them. This is an EdTech client that provides tutoring to students in the U.S. And they had, um, as with many of our clients, they had, uh, in the pandemic, realized that they needed to support remote tutoring. They used uh, an off-the-shelf tool that we all know initially, and as often happens, uh, at least with our types of clients, um, you know, they discovered that trying to fit their unique model into an off-the-shelf tool that was really designed for corporate meetings originally meant that they were compromising the way that they did instruction, and so they wanted something more custom and that's often kind of the story that we hear from people we work with. So some of the features that we built into that, uh, certainly video chat between instructors and students, and these are some of my coworkers, neither instructors nor students, uh, in, in a test version of it. But some things that were not easily built into off-the-shelf tools or ability for instructors to move between different rooms uh, easily, integrating in, in this case, we used a third-party whiteboard tool um, and you know other more common features too, like text chat, screen sharing, and of course, especially in an education space, we have to uh, log in. Security and privacy should be important everywhere, but particularly important when uh, uh, children may be involved. So this is just a couple screenshots from that application. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting one to support. They do work at a uh, pretty high volume, lots of locations across the U.S. Uh, and with you know, demographics that uh, not always has a ton of experience with uh, an application, plus we're talking about a custom application. So lots of factors to consider there in, in uh, managing and supporting that. So prior to deployment, if we want to make the management process as easy as possible, then we need to consider a number of factors uh, and design for them in advance. Um, and I, I liked this quote, this is from Scaling Tech Podcast, which, quick plug, is a podcast that, that I do that's outside of WebRTC space, just about managing engineering teams in general. And I was talking with author Kelly Shortridge, who's the author of uh, Security Chaos Engineering. Uh, and uh, I like this quote from her in talking about managing complexity of, it's, it's 
when, when things go wrong, if you're blaming the human, that's kind of a classic mistake that, that we make. Is we shouldn't, if, instead of blaming the humans, although that's the easiest thing to do, it's an indication of something we didn't design for, something wrong in our system, in our process, that is the act, you know, that can be solved so that we're not blaming the humans anymore after that, right? So if we design properly in advance for that, then hopefully we won't have to blame the humans so much. So we want to design for security from the start, uh, certainly for management, we want to make sure that we're designing in for observability, building in logging and monitoring, monitoring and alerts into both the application and the DevOps around it. Uh, thinking about how we're going to test this, and I'll talk a little bit about some load testing that we did as part of this, uh, and resilience uh, to making sure that it's scalable, that we have good error handling, so that when inevitable errors occur, because they will occur, of course, um, that we respond to them gracefully. And then at a process level, we also want to make sure that we're designing for change. Um, oops. Yeah, okay, sorry. Thought I skipped ahead there. So uh, just quick mention, most of the work that we do is on the AWS stack, so a lot of the tools that we're building around that, but making sure that we've got things configured in advance for alerts that get to our team through Slack and email, through um, having good logging and exception handling and capturing as much context around those errors as possible so that we can troubleshoot them when they occur, monitoring uptime, and then of course, uh, hopefully, the, la the, the last way that we hear about something is through Zendesk, through a support ticket actually lodged, uh, logged by the customer. Ideally, We've got enough, enough logging monitoring built into this that we recognize the error is happening prior to being contacted by the customer, but of course we need to have a good process around receiving that error as well, uh, receiving that support request from them rather. And then designing well for resilience in particular, um, making sure that we've got a cloud uh, environment set up that will have high availability across multiple zones, in particular the zones where our client is in that particular case, that we have auto scaling built in and that part of the reason that we do the load testing is just to make sure that we know what are the proper uh, triggers to build in for those that auto scaling, uh, that we have a good com uh, continuous integration, continuous development environment set up for our team so that that's helping helping us to enforce good development practices and deployment practices around that. So on the um, testing side, just a couple uh, examples from some of the load testing we did before this. Uh, we used uh, Loadero as the load testing tool in this case. Most important thing first is define what, it is, what is the success criteria from the perspective of your users. In our case, you, know, you have lots of students joining a virtual room and instructors, so making sure that the students were able to successfully join that room without any errors presented. Uh, what are the met metrics that we're going to track towards that su success goal? Uh, and we were mainly interested in like round trip time. What are some different scripts and test cases that do a pretty good job of covering the most common paths in the application and paths that maybe we're most worried about in terms of scalability, having those scripted out. So we looked at things around logging, uh, logging in, joining a classroom, the ability of instructors to assign students to different classrooms and put them in there, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and, um, and then uh, building in different phases, ramping that up, which I'll talk about too. So, uh, obviously, these things do make a difference in, in, uh, in, in having the application as usable as possible for the customers. I mean, one thing that is really important to note and why we care about things like how long does it take and does it work at scale of just assigning students to a classroom is that one of the pro pain points that our client had with other applications in the past was that because they weren't configured to their workflow, they had to do a lot of manual configuration prior to every session, prior to every classroom. So instructors had to actually like set up the classroom for about 20 minutes prior to each individual session. They couldn't save that or use that across different classroom sessions, that sort of thing. So making sure that, you know, I mean the biggest boost that we provided to them with a custom application perhaps beyond the branding and, and uh, 
the workflow within the application was how much time it saved the instructors in the setup to it. So thinking about use cases, not only when you're in the room, but things that you do as you are setting up you know, the scenario, right, for the students. So these were some of the uh, types of tests and phases that we ran and, and kind of scaling up the users and thinking about in a communications application, right, I, I think a lot of times in load testing, you, you're, you're sort of thinking about maybe one generic scenario. If I have a web page that's going to load and I, I want to know, can 100 people look at it or 100 million people look at it? Communication application is different, right, because we have at least two sorts of uh, modalities, not quite the right word to use, but two different ways we want to look at lots of people on the system, but then also because we're inherently dealing with groups of people, like in a group chat together, how many people can we have in a single group chat is a different type of load test than how many group chats can we have in parallel across the application, or how many people can we have, you know, signing up for the application at the same time, right? Those are very dis distinct use cases. So we want to make sure that we're covering all those types of situations, so we had first, you know, let's just have kind of a a, a load testing smoke test, test a single classroom, figure out what's the practical limit of number of students that we can have in a single classroom. But then knowing that their normal classroom is not going to be that large, let's test across a wide number of classrooms going on at the same time in a more typical size, 10, 12 students in their <coughs> case. And then figuring out what are the upper limits of that system to in a, in a final stress test. And uh, of course, you know, I'd like to think that the first time we commit code, it's already perfect, but um, you know, show of hands of anyone who's ever done that, I didn't think so. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, some of the things we discovered in doing that, uh, that were, you know, were really helpful in management of this and also helping us to figure out how to um, uh, configure our auto scaling was uh, looking at you know realizing that for example again this is something kind of unique to a communication application when the way that you handle connections and subscriptions to a room is very important if we have a chat room a video call between two people then how I handle the connections of those two people to the room maybe is not a big deal I'm not going to notice an inefficiency in my code but if I've got 50 people in the room and I'm now managing state between 50 different people, that's much bigger, right? And then especially if there's a thousand rooms in parallel happening like that with 50 users, we start to notice problems. So one of the quick things that we noticed when we first started doing some of the load tests was that uh, we weren't handling the subscriptions as well as we should have, and so the team did a uh, Redis layer that implemented a more efficient search around that. We also noticed some just inefficiencies in the UI code that needed to be cleaned up, put in some better state management around that, and it helped us figure out what sort of like CPU utilization levels we needed to care about as far as uh, auto scaling. And then we tried also to make sure that we were simulating uh, uh, scenarios that were maybe a little bit tighter than we expected in the field, so having uh, just two gig of of RAM being important consideration. Let's let's keep that kind of tight and see what we can do in that situation because we'll certainly have a wide range of uh, devices and users on different types of devices as well as different types of internet connections. And uh, as I said, the round trip time was kind of the thing that we were paying the most attention to and found that that was, that was pretty acceptable uh, what we were seeing uh, across the different phases of these tests. One of the really nice things about this client is that um, they work across the United States in a franchisee model. So they have lots of different users who are kind of like independent owner operators of their facilities. And so they have a big annual conference where they bring them all together. And so this was a really great way for us to roll out what was a big process change to them as well as a whole new mode of teaching was everything was timed for this conference that they held a couple of months ago. So our team was able to attend that, and uh, you can see the, the, this video on repeat here, one of their, one of their owner operators uh, testing out the uh, whiteboard capabilities. 
that was a third party tool that we integrated into the rest of this. So that was interesting too, to think from a support perspective, we have to think about slightly different SLAs of how fast we can respond to things that we built in the application versus things that are really dependent on somebody else. We can't, we can only be but so responsible for this whiteboard application since we didn't build it. But it works pretty well, it's pretty cool, and you can, you can see how you can get to have a, a really nice experience in a remote situation. And so their users, this effectively was a pilot group for us. It was presented at this conference, people were able to use the initial versions of it, uh, and we got a lot of great feedback on it from that. So launching to a pilot group, if you can do it in a setting like this, was, was wonderful, but remotely just as important as well. And uh, uh, generally speaking, we were most of us familiar with support teams in general, but you know, for us, because we're building a custom application, one particularly important thing there is to think about the difference, because it's probably not the same people who built the application versus those who, who support it, so managing that transition is very important. Uh, and then also for us, a really important point is that we're not handling actually their like customer support center. We're tier two and tier three support for them, but their tier one support, which the client is responsible for, has never really had experience with a WebRTC-based video chat application before other than this one off the shelf one that they can't, couldn't really support anyways, right? So we had to make sure the most important thing was making sure that we transferred some of our knowledge, our expertise to that tier one support team so that they could handle most of the issues. <clears throat> and then I like this idea of error budgets too, just to briefly mention um, that uh, uh, the idea here being you have a certain amount of uptime and that translate to how, translates to how many hours of downtime are you allowed this month. And so making sure that you commu communicate that well with customers when the inevitable problems happen. Hey, we're still, you know, I know we had X number of minutes of downtime in your window there, that's still within the, the budget that we have based on the SLA. And therefore, because we've got some budget space, we're also gonna do a little bit of chaos engineering testing in production, uh, you know, uh, because we've got some budget to spare. Like, you know, not that you have to hit that budget. Uh, you don't use it or lose it in that sort of budget but at least knowing how much impact you're having uh, and being able to communicate if you're within bounds of the contract. Making sure obviously that you've got different on-call uh, roles covered, that's fairly obvious. Just key point for us here was, again, because it's a custom application, making sure that we have the right combination of developer and DevOps skills in every on-call window uh, and that that's covered over the full window, even though these are not necessarily the people who built it, they have to have enough knowledge to handle at least tier two support requests. And then tier three, we can sort of cover in our normal business hours with the original team when needed. Uh, in communication applications, we wanna make sure that we're logging and uh, considering metrics specifically around the call quality, things like packet loss and jitter. Um, round trip time being really important. We could also try to log other things. For instance, if someone is logging into your application and you do a network speed test at the beginning, you know, sometimes you see that on your, like prior to joining the call, you see that option. Logging that in the system so you have, you know, maybe some evidence of what quality of connection was that person on, which they then complained to you about, and now you know a little bit more, is it, is it our fault? Is it the user's fault? Were they in a bad coffee shop or whatever? And uh, in terms of tracking that, there's commercial tooling you can look at, like Monitor RTC and Test RTC. Uh, a lot of times we're working with a CPaaS. In this case, we're using Vonage, and so we can use their specific tooling, their session inspector, to go look at details of specific calls. We could also build in uh, our own more custom recording of uh, statistics based on the WebRTC standard directly or just anything else that we can track in the application. So again, designing for that upfront so that we have that information and uh, as I mentioned, it's really important that we explain to the Tier 1 team what sort of, sort of issues they are going to encounter. Can't turn on my camera. How do I unmute? You know, that sort of stuff is obviously going to happen inevitably, so we have to prepare them for that. And that also, I think, gets to an interesting thing that I don't, I don't feel like we have solved, but I'll throw it out there if you feel like you have. Feel free to explain it to me later. How do you consider what is actual downtime, right? Because again, in a sort of a traditional web application, downtime is the page loaded or not. I created my account or not. But if I'm on a poor quality video call, is that downtime? 
How do, where do I draw that line? How do I measure that? How do I incorporate that into my error budget, into my SLA? Was this call degradation our fault? And it's therefore downtime of some form? Uh, or is it, you know, the user's in bad network conditions, but we should just, just be able to handle that better? Is that downtime? So anyway, it's not something we have the answer to yet, but I think is uh, interesting to consider. And then uh, finally, <clears throat> making sure that after the deployment, you're still factoring in these things over time. That's our COO, Mariana. She um, comes from a UX background, so she's always really passionate in making sure that we're factoring this into our work with our clients too, around what, what's the feedback that we're getting from users. So we went to that conference, which was awesome, got a lot of feedback there. We can stay in touch with pilot groups, uh, power users but also making sure that even though we're not handling the tier one support, that we are keeping open communication with them because that's gonna be our most important um, way of measuring how upset users are. Uh, and even though we may think we did a really good job of placing the mute on mute button, if we're getting way too many tier one support requests logged about that, that would never get to our team if we don't ask them you know, what sort of requests that they're getting if we don't keep that communication open so that we can handle that with them. And then an ideally, you know, final unfortunate business thing you have to consider too is, you know, features versus bugs and who pays for this. Because in an ideal world, we would just constantly improve everything that we can for free and everybody would be happy. In our case, we're a contractor to people, so we do have to consider how, you know, if the, how much time is built into the contract, uh, how much support and how much sort of new development and bug fixes can we do within the course of that and make sure that that's considered in here as well. So that's pretty much it. Um, old music reference there, but this is just a video from that conference too. A couple people from our team and one of the people from Vaughn is there too. They had a lot of fun. So again, find clients with cool conferences is maybe my final tip of advice, uh, my final tip for you and who you work with. And that's it. If you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, take them. But I think we're right at time. Yep, so. it was perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs>